Oh, hello there. Today, we will be examining a few of the characters within the Bloodborne universe. I have here a guidebook, an official Bloodborne guidebook, very thoroughly examines everything about the game. So, semi-experimental, not really, but in the fact that I'm filming with another camera as well. Um, we're going to check out a few of my favorite characters from Bloodborne. And if you don't know what Bloodborne is, it's a video game on the PlayStation 4 exclusively that is from the same company that does Dark Souls. And if you know about Dark Souls, you know it's a game where you learn from uh, your mistakes, sort of, and, and how hard it is, and that's how you get better at it. So first up, folks, we have the Large Huntsman. We're going to be reading the descriptions and just checking out these enemies and characters. Um, just random ones and ones that I think are cool and are some of my favorites. The Large Huntsman. These slow-moving enemies suffer from advanced stages of the Scourge, and while that makes them stronger than normal Huntsmen, they are not quite transformed enough to suffer the attack bonuses against beasts, and do not take additional damage from fire. They are, however, quite vulnerable to interrupts due to their slow and predictable attacks, so it's worth having a firearm at the ready when you approach one. The most common version you'll come across is armed with a torch and a crosscut saw, and at close range they'll often perform combos where they swing both of their weapons in horizontal arcs. Quick stepping through one of these attacks gives you an opportunity to land a charged R2. They also have a hard knockdown attack that slams you to the ground when it connects. If it hits you, immediately roll to the side, because they'll often follow up with a downward stab using their torch. The less common spear version also has a similar knockdown attack and downward stab follow-up, and you can evade that one in the same way. While this version shares the same generally slow attacks as the others, its spear has considerably more range so you'll need to take that into account when approaching one. The plow-carrying version use their weapon in much the same way as the saw ones, with an even greater emphasis on slow, overhead attacks that slam you down to the ground if they connect. Because these overhead attacks are so slow, however, it gives you plenty of time to interrupt them, or quick step behind them for an R1 chain or charged R2 strike. Their range is slightly longer than the size of their makeshift weapons might suggest, so be careful not to get too close to them during their combos. So we're going to skim through here. There's a lot of characters in this game. Um, and we'll check out the ones that I think... I like all the characters, basically, but we're just going to just nitpick a few of them. Alright, here's some cool... This is a cool enemy. Hemwick Grave Women. There's a area on the game called Hemwick Charnel Lane. And it's probably one of my favorite areas just because it's got a very spooky vibe and just really creepy and gothic feel to it. And the first time I, I got there, I was like, wow, this is cool. Owen Wilson, wow. These Hemwick grave women. These graveyard-dwelling madwomen have very low health but are usually found in groups using their numbers to make up for their individual weaknesses. Luring them out one at a time using pebbles will help to greatly reduce the threat they pose. When not patrolling in groups, 
They'll often hide and attempt to ambush you, either with direct attacks or using shoves to try and knock you off cliffs. So be careful any time you round a corner in areas where grave women are located. They can be interrupted and staggered, and due to their frailty, rolling into them will send them reeling off balance and generally give you enough time to follow through with a quick R1 chain before they regain their footing. Rolling into them will also knock them out of their attacks, which can be useful if you're facing down a group of them. Remember that you must perform a roll and not a quick step, so it's best to fight them without locking on. The sickle and cleaver carrying grave women attack in a similar manner, using quick slashes and combos to try and overwhelm you, but the short reach of their attacks means you can often hit them from outside of their range. The sickle users will occasionally use a slower overhead swing with a long wind-up that causes them to lose their balance afterward, giving you an opportunity to counterattack. The red-hot pole irons carried by some grave women inflict fire damage and can easily cause you to flinch, making it difficult to escape further attacks. The weight of their weapons prevents them from being able to use long combos, so you generally only have to worry about evading single hits, but the range they can use their attacks from does make closing in on them more difficult than other grave women. Wooden mallets also become a fearsome weapon in the hands of some grave women. They'll use them to perform powerful horizontal swings and overhead smashes. Mallet wielders have the slowest attack speed due to the weight of their weapon, making them extremely vulnerable to interrupts if you can spare the bullets. The final type of grave woman does not use a melee weapon as her primary form of offense, and instead prefers to stand back in out-of-reach spots from which they'll bombard you with molotovs. They're especially dangerous when other enemies are nearby, since they have impeccable aim, can hit you at great distances, and the splash damage of their molotov is hard to avoid. Once you're close to them, however, they'll begin using the same cleaver attacks as the torch bearers. Okay, so those were the Hemwick Grave Women. Tell you what, you don't want to swipe them right on Tinder. You know? Man. Man, there's so many cool enemies in this game, but I'm just going to pick the ones that, that I really think are just something else. Okay. Like I said, I like probably 99% of them. But um, I want to find ones that are just extraordinary and stand out so much, to me at least. Okay, we're going into the strong enemies territory now. So things are getting, you know, serious here. Okay, the big pig, aka man-eater boar. I'm trying to I'm sort of multitasking where I'm holding this camera in my hand, and I guess you can see me doing this now. Um, okay, man-eater boar. If these gigantic pigs spot you from far away, they'll charge in to perform a tackle with their massive bodies. You better not bring bacon near them because they'll know and they'll get even angrier. At close range, they attack with a straightforward set of head swings, body presses, and clouds of poisonous mist. In spite of their size, man-eater boars are very predictable opponents, and their attack patterns create many openings to interrupt and stagger them. Their attacks tend to strike wide areas and can also damage other enemies, so use this to your advantage if the situation allows. Man-eater boars will chase pungent blood cocktails, allowing you to set them up for a stagger or trick them into hitting their allies. They're also affected by shaman bone blades, which will cause them to actively hunt down and attack other enemies nearby. The man-eater boars, encountered in the Nightmare of Mensis, sport additional eyes, but attack in exactly the same way as the others. It's a lot I want to go over. 
one of these enemies. So I guess we won't read every single thing about them. Okay. Okay, here we go. This is probably my favorite enemy in the game. Okay. These things are called winter lanterns and they do this singing thing where they kind of do a out of semi out of tune like singing chants and it's like really unsettling like oh man there's a winter lantern around the corner. Better be ready. Grotesque creatures with few attacks but a lethal gimmick. Winter lanterns will constantly damage you and build up your frenzy meter with their gaze. This ability will affect you from absurd distances and cannot be avoided by any means other than putting an obstacle between yourself and your target, making it almost impossible to approach these enemies without taking damage due to the danger of frenzy buildup. A full inventory of sedatives is highly recommended when facing them. At close range, they will exclusively use a running grab with a very wide hitbox. This attack carries them forward up to two meters and has decent tracking, requiring you to dodge as late as possible in order to avoid being hit at the end of a quick step. Okay, here we have Father Gascoin, who's one of the first two bosses, um, depending on which one you, you go to first. So he's pretty cool. Scary man. Father Gascoin, level, um, well, let's read the overview. You'll face Father Gascoin after crossing Central Yarnum's lower bridge. During phase one, he'll attack you with his Hunter Axe and a Blunderbuss. He uses the normal Hunter Axe moveset with a couple, addition, couple of additions, such as the Rising Shear. He'll also shoot at you when you're at medium range. Be warned that he will sometimes shoot you if you dodge backwards, away from his melee. After losing 20% of his health, he can transform his weapon to begin phase 2. Sometimes the timing of this transformation varies. He likes to have some space before he extends his axe. His attacks are a bit slower in this phase, but he has a lot more range. His spin and slash hits twice, so be careful when dodging forward. He will start using jumping attacks to close the distance, but be warned that, unlike a player using the Hunter Axe, he can still shoot you. After losing 70% of his health, he will change into a beast, and Phase 3 begins. He will become very fast and aggressive, but he gains weaknesses to both fire and saw attacks. He's pretty cool, where he turns into a big werewolf, be you know, beast, um, in the last part of the fight. He is just something else, you know. Got a lot of good bosses in this game, and some of them are really hard. Some of them I still have trouble with. All right, we got Dark Beast, Dark Beast Parl, aka Dank Beast Parl, or Dank Beast Carl, or uh, Big Daddy Carl Parl. Uh, you know, whatever you prefer to call DP uh, for short. So let's read, let's read his overview. All right. Dark Beast Parl is an extremely agile and aggressive boss whose attacks can be incredibly difficult to avoid. He'll constantly circle you outside the reach of your melee attacks and will immediately back up if you advance toward him, preventing you from being able to hit him or use the blind spot underneath him to avoid his melee swings. He will continuously reposition himself to keep you at mid-range while leaping in to strike with wide horizontal sweeps and overhead slams, and will perform combos of up to four hits with massive range and highly varied timing. Dealing heavy damage to Parl's head in a short period of time will stagger him and allow you to perform a front visceral attack. Repeatedly striking his limbs will knock him down and dispel his lightning, uh, lightning aura, at which point he'll take 50% more damage until he restores it. 
almost all of Parle's physical attacks leave lingering trails of lightning that will damage you on contact. Some of them also generate large spherical blasts of electricity, either in front of him or to his sides. He uses the same set of attacks during both phases of the battle, but during the second phase his swings will generate forward waves of sparks, and the radius of the lightning blasts they, will gener they generate will double. Yeah, so you find Dark Beast Parl in, in um, Yahar, Yahar Ghoul. Was it Yahar? No. Wait, it was... It's a place where you go... It's a, it's a semi-secret area. Um, wait a minute now, I'm curious. Did it say it already? Does it say the location? Alright, now I gotta go check it out and make sure I'm... Yeah, okay. Ah, oh, yes. Martyr Lagarius. The Forsaken Castle Hain. Uh, uh, excuse me, Forsaken Castle, Kanehurst. So, Martyr Ligarius is pretty cool. He's this guy who's got a crown. Um, when I first found him and stuff and tried to fight, I think he kind of kind of whipped whipped me up a lot. He he kicked my arse. Um. He's pretty unforgiving, but uh, once you learn, once you learn, that's the cool thing about these games is you get kind of frustrated sometimes, and then you go, and then one, you know, usually you get to a point where it just clicks, and you go, okay, now I know what to do. Lagarius is an extremely fast and agile opponent but many of his attacks are highly predictable and provide excellent opportunities to interrupt him. During phase one, he'll bombard you from long range with large clouds of dark spirits and use quicker versions of these spells up close. His melee attacks at this stage consist of slow scythe combos and faster sword slashes. He'll respond to frontal attacks and punish you for standing too close by using either a nearly instant frontal skull blast or a delayed explosion. He'll immediately use these techniques, or a quick sword slash after standing up from a visceral attack. At the start of phase two, he'll perform his spirit wave, surrounding himself with an aura that deflects bullets and grants him an enormous amount of super armor. Then he'll assault you with swift melee combos and flying slashes while periodically summoning a cloud of swords that will rain down on you from above. Lagarius is strong against all elemental attacks, but is least resistant to fire. His physical defense is much lower. However, so melee, however, so melee weapons augmented with fire paper will inflict the most damage. Let's see. I think we're going to read one more. And... I might do a part two of this video at some point down the line, uh, depending on like if if um, people liked it or you know would be want to see some more of these or these bosses. Just want to pick up a really good boss for the final final you know boss that I read about. Man, there's so many good ones. Those are Chalice Dungeon bosses. All right, let me see. Okay, this guy's cool. Mikolash, host of the nightmare. Got a big, like a bird cage on his head. And legend has it that, um, at one point in time, he actually let a bird live in there while he was, uh, while it was on his head, and 
And then after a little bit, he's like, okay, I've had enough of this bird living above my head, so I have to let it fly away. Okay, overview of Mikolash. This unusual boss battle is essentially a game of cat and mouse. During the first phase, you'll have to chase Mikolash around the library. Sounds fun. While avoiding the skeletal puppets wandering the area and ultimately herd him into a dead-end room, or he'll be forced into combat. If you attack him in the hallways, he'll teleport a short distance away from you and will flee again as soon as you approach. For detailed maps and information on the positions you'll need to use to trap Mikolash, please refer to P-154. The room in which you'll need to corner him houses a few skeletal puppets that can either help or hinder you, depending upon which steps you took to prepare. Mikolash will initially strafe around you and periodically cast Augur of Ebriatus. At the beginning of Phase 2, he'll teleport away, and the fog blocking the exit will vanish, allowing you to access the central staircase. When you reach the top, you'll have to pursue him through a larger and more complicated series of rooms and corner him again. You'll still have to deal with wandering skeletal puppets, and Mikolash will now escape from you by jumping into the mirrors scattered throughout the area and emerging in a different location. After chasing him into the dead-end room in the center of this area, the gate will close behind him, trapping him inside. When you enter this room from above and engage him, he'll fight the same way as during Phase 1, but will now also use a call beyond. And a call beyond is this big old spell where he puts his hands above his head, and it's really hard to avoid. Um, yeah, so if there's any of you guys who play Bloodborne, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, I suggest, you know, the game to anybody who has a PS4, especially because now it's, it's like 20 bucks brand new now, and the DLC is also... Probably one of the best DLCs I've ever played, and uh, it's it's pretty long, and it's really good if you ask me. So guys, thanks a lot for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the characters of Bloodborne. Um, and if you liked the video, consider giving it a like and maybe subscribing. Uh, and other than that, guys, we'll see you for more videos. And thanks a lot for watching.